So to start, look at the definition of the sovereignty of God. And the, the meaning of the sovereignty of God is that as creator of the universe, God rules over his creation with absolute authority and infinite power. And I think every Christian, pretty much every believer, will believe and acknowledge that God is sovereign. Um, and would most likely, anyone who does believe that God is sovereign, would agree with this definition. That he is the creator, uh, that he does rule over his creation, and that he, his authority is absolute. Uh, there's no limit. And the same thing with his power. It is infinite. So most would agree that God is sovereign according to this definition. However, there are many Christians, I would say with, within all of uh, those who are Christians, there's a lot of variation as to what truly their belief in God's sovereignty is, is because the question is, what is meant by these words? You know, when it says that God rules over his creation, exactly how involved is he in his ruling? Um, in what's going on here on this earth. When it says his authority is absolute, I mean, even to the point where it's he has authority even over our will, our, our free will, and power. You know, how far does he take this and use his power in his sovereignty, even to the point where uh, he will control all of nature, all that's happening here on this earth? So that's where the questions come regarding God's sovereignty. I put that down here below, regard, underneath the definition, the question being, when we say that God is sovereign, does this mean that God is merely the one that all humans answer to, as if he's you know, a judge, he's up on his throne, and one day we stand before him and we are judged by him, he is the highest authority to judge us. Is that all it means, or does it mean he is exerting some influence over his creation, now and then he inserts himself into the affairs of, of life and things here on earth? or that he is controlling every single aspect that occurs on earth. Uh, so that's the real question, and so what I want to do is take us through a lot of passages of Scripture, a lot of Scripture, and hopefully you can determine by what you see in God's Word the answer to, those, to that question. So we'll start with God's sovereignty over all things. Um, and... Right there, God's sovereignty over all things. In Psalm 103, 19, it says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. So, a literal throne in heaven, God rules from, and it says his kingdom is over all. We usually think of a kingdom based on its borders. That's how we define a certain kingdom here on this earth. You look at the borders, okay, that's where that kingdom is. But for God, it's overall. There are no borders. It's the entire earth, it's all the nations, it's the entire universe, all the galaxies, it's everything. So his kingdom rules over all. Everything is included inside his kingdom. Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens, he does all that he pleases. So for us, because our authority is limited, because our power is limited, we can only do some of the things that please us, that we would like to do. Because we don't have the authority to do, or the power to do, all that we would want to do. But God, again, highest authority, unlimited power, so he does all that he pleases. And it's also good to keep in mind, we kind of sometimes get this idea to, in our head because it's d depicted, you know, God and Satan are arm wrestling. as if it's this equal battle between good and evil. Not at all. God is infinitely powerful, and Satan is limited. We are closer in power to Satan than Satan is to God in power. And we have to keep that in mind. Psalm 135, 6, The Lord does all that pleases him in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas, and in all their depths. So it's not just that God is ruling and active in the heavens, but he is active, involved here on the earth, in the seas, in all their depths. So the places we can't even go or see, the ocean trend, he's, he's doing things everywhere that please him. So that's all things nature. Let's look at nature. Job 37, 5 to 7 and 10, 10 to 13. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. 
Likewise to the downpour, his mighty downpour. So thunder, snow, downpour. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick cloud with moisture. The clouds scatter his lightning. So ice, waters, cloud, lightning. God is in control when it comes to weather. They turn around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world. So all of weather is serving God and doing his, you know, fulfilling his purpose, all that he commands them to do. And it's interesting, it says weather for correction. So weather to correct people, maybe with drought, causing a famine, a drought, or for his land, or maybe he just wants to take care of his land that he created, or for love. Maybe he wants to bless people and send the rains and the sunshine. Whatever it is, at the bottom you can see he causes it to happen. Psalm 135, 6 and 7. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. It, he it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain and brings forth the wind from the storehouses. You can see his control over these things. He's making the clouds. He's making lightning to bring the rain, and he's bringing forth wind. Psalm 104, 13 and 14. From your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate. So again, he brings the rains on the mountains. He's the one that's causing every little inch of plant that grows. He's causing it to be there so that man can cultivate it. It's all because of him. Animals. Let's see what it says regarding God's sovereignty over animals. Genesis 6.20, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, and of every creeping thing of the ground, <coughs> <I'm sorry. coughs> according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. So when you think about, a lot of people like wonder, how in the world did Noah get all these two of every animal onto the ark? Well, it says that they shall come into you. So the animals came from all directions to Noah. Then they went up into the ark because God was the one that was controlling them and causing them to come to Noah and then come onto the ark. How can one person get all these, you know, two of every, it's impossible. God was the one sovereignly in control. But on that, Exodus 8, 22, but on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. So when he's bringing all these plagues on Egypt and he brings, in this instance, the plague of the flies, he's controlling all the little flight patterns of these little flies so that none of them go over this line over to where Israel is. God is sovereignly in control of the, of the swarms of flies. Not one of them will go over to where the Israelites are so that they know the Lord is in the midst of the earth. He controls even the flights of little flies. Matthew ten twenty nine Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? It says, as you know, inconsequential as these sparrows are, the cheapest thing, you, just a copper coin can buy two of them, and yet not a single one of them ever goes to the earth unless the Lord is there in control, aware um, of what's going on. Luck. Let's see what it, God's Word says regarding His sovereignty over what we perceive as luck. We perceive it as just chance, coincidence, luck. Well, in Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Think about that. All the lots that are cast, the dice, you know, all the casinos, and every single decision, every time it rolls to what it rolls onto, every decision is from the Lord. 2 Chronicles 8.27-33. Here's an instance where Micaiah the prophet comes to King Ahab and says, you're going to die in battle, uh, which you're going, this this battle that you're going into. And he says to King Ahab, 
Second Chronicles 18, 27 and 33. If you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. And if you come back in peace, that means the Lord hasn't spoken by me because I'm telling you, you're going to die. And then you read down a little bit later, but a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate. So completely at random, this guy not even, you know, just pulls and yanks, shoots, and it hits the king in the one spot probably that it could possibly hit between the armor to where, and then he dies. So it looks random from our perspective. It's not at all. God guided that arrow. Uh, nations. Acts 17, 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. So from one man, Adam, God used him to make all the nations that exist. Not only that, but he determined their allotted periods. So when they would arise in history and how long they would exist in history, that nation. And the boundaries, what their borders would be, how extensive the kingdom would be, or how small it would be. Job 12, 23. He makes nations great, and he destroys them. He enlarges nations, and he leads them away. They come and they go, all according to God's doing and plan. <coughs> now look at God's sovereignty over life. Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance... In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So before we are born, when there's none of our days that have occurred yet, already in his book are written every single day that is granted to us here on this earth. Every sing- the number is in his book. He has determined how many days we have here on this earth. Same thing you see in Job 14, 1 to 5. Man who is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. Since his days are determined and the number of his months is with you and you have appointed his limits that he cannot pass. You cannot pass beyond the months, the days that God has appointed for us, our life here on this earth. Now man's way. Jeremiah 10, 23, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. So we would like it to be that we can determine our way in life, but in the end, all of us look back and think, what, how did I end up here? How did I get, how did this, because I was going and I was planning and I was doing all this, So it's not in man who walks. So we're the one who's walking through life, but it's not in us to direct our steps. It's the Lord who does that. And that's what it says in Proverbs 20, 24. A man's steps are from the Lord. How then can man understand his way? We don't. We we get sometimes frustrated, confused. We don't understand because ultimately it's God who is um, determining the course of our life. Skills and abilities. What does it say regarding that? Exodus 31, 1 to 3 and 6. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. God places in individuals what measure of abilities and intelligence and knowledge and craftsmanship and skills. Ultimately, he gives those those gifts, those talents, so much we are wired with from the start that he blesses us with and that he blessed Betzalel with intentionally so that he could use that in the building of, of the tabernacle. And behold... Also in the same passage, I have appointed with him Ahoyab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. So he's saying, I put in the people of Israel the ability to do what I'm asking them to do. I've 
I've given that ability into it, the people. That comes from, from me. 1 Corinthians 4, 7, same thing in the New Testament. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Why do we brag? Why do we, why do we have arrogance that I can do this? You can't do that. Anything that we can do is because God created us in such a way to be able to do it. It's a gift that he gave us, a talent he gave us, an ability that if he wanted to, he could take it away like that. So why do we boast about it um, as if we did not, as if it wasn't given to us, as if it comes out of us? It doesn't. It comes from him. Rulers' decisions. Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Ultimately, ultimately, even the decisions that the kings are making, it's right there in the hand of the Lord to turn it like a stream of water wherever he will. And in fact, I love how this verse literally tells us that's what's going on. Ezra 6.22. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Literally, he's turning the heart of the king like a stream of water in this passage, just like it says in Proverbs. All plans. Proverbs 16.9, the heart of man plans his way but the Lord establishes his steps. So we can make plans. We can make seven, eight, nine, ten plans, but it's really determined whether God is going to establish that plan and allow it to to take place. It's really up to his will. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So we make plans for our own purposes. This is what I'm going to do, and this is why I'm going to do it, because I want this to... Result. But God says, it's not your purpose ultimately. God has a purpose for all things, and that's what will stand. So that's God's sovereignty over all things. Try to look at a wide breadth of, of different aspects of life to show his sovereignty over it all. But now, one of the you know, biggest questions that come to mind is, okay, well, what about evil? Well, we know that God is holy. We know he's perfectly holy, but is he still, in some way we cannot comprehend maybe, even sovereign over the evil that takes place on this earth? Well, the Bible does very much address this uh, in, in many different places. If you look at uh, the, the story of Joseph and his brothers, here we can see the evil intent. Genesis 37, 20, 24, and 28. Come now, this is the brothers talking about Joseph, let us kill him. And throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him. And we will see what will become of his dreams. And they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. A lot of evil intent there. Kill him or throw him into a pit. You know, originally they were going to kill him. Keep reading. Then Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted out him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. So, they were going to kill him. Then they said, well, let's just sell him as a slave. That's the price of a slave, 20 shekels of silver. So they sold their brother away for good to Egypt as a slave. That's all evil intent. But then you read in Genesis 50, 20, As for you, Joseph speaking to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. What you meant, in the same way that they meant something, God meant something. And it's the same it. What you, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. So somehow, they're meaning it for evil, but God is meaning it and in, 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 in behind it, in, in a way, to bring about his purpose, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. As we know, Joseph saved so many people. So you can see God's sovereignty over even the evil of the brothers of Joseph. Pharaoh's heart. This is interesting when you look at the story of Pharaoh. Because in these three passages, we see that Pharaoh is hardening his heart. 
Exodus 8, 15 and 32. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a, resp a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. That's Exodus 8, 15 and 32. So two times, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Also in Exodus 9, 34. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So three times, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And yet, look at this, Exodus 4, 21. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Exodus 9, 12. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. He did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Exodus 10, 20. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He did not let the people go. So three times Pharaoh hardens his heart. Three times it says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh's doing evil, and yet God is sovereign over it. And what is the intent? We can see in Exodus 9, 16. But for this purpose I have raised you up, talking to Pharaoh. God talking to Pharaoh. For this purpose I have raised you up, to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Through the plagues, through all that took place, God put on display his power to both Pharaoh and to the whole earth. And we read about it hundreds of years later in the Bible, people saying, well, this is the nation that where God did. So it, it was very well known. Same thing in Romans 9, 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I've raised you up that I might show you my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So God was sovereign over it, even over the evil acts of Pharaoh in order for his purpose to display his power. The Canaanites, they refused to seek peace with the, with the Israelites. Joshua eleven twenty. For it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy, but be destroyed, just as the Lord commanded Moses. For many years, the Canaanites were evil, wicked, and so God decided to punish them, and here, they hardened their hearts against the Israelites. They wouldn't seek peace. They came out against Israel and their God. But we can see that God is behind it. Hardening their hearts so that they will come out against them um, and be defeated. And then Samson. We can see the evil that Samson did. Judges 14, 3 and 4. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among all our people, that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Gather her, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. So it was wrong. It was evil. The Israelites were commanded to not marry foreign wives because they would take their hearts away from the true God of Israel. So they were supposed to marry within Israel. That was the evil that Samson did. But look at what it says in the next verse. Judges 14, 3 and 4. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord. For he would, God was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. And that time, at that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. So even though Samson was doing something wrong, seeking a wife, a foreign wife, outside of Israel, and yet it was from the Lord because he was going to use this as an opportunity for punishment against the Philistines through Samson and what the things that he would do to the Philistines. Uh, King Saul, 1 Samuel 16, 14. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. So God removes his spirit from Saul and sovereignly allows that a harmful spirit should be permitted to come and to torment Saul. It's evil the spirit and what it does to, to Saul, but the Lord is sovereign over it. Uh, David, if you remember this, the census that he took, remember that? Uh, 2 Samuel 24, 1, again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So the Lord is upset, kindled anger against Israel, determined to punish them in a way, in a certain way. And it moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. So because of God's anger, he had determined that he's going to punish uh, the people of Israel. And it's done through this evil act of David, who's not supposed to 
take a census. Um, there was the, only by command of God that they, the kings were told to do it, and they were told to do it in a very specific way in the Mosaic Law, and he was breaking that. And so, in some way, because God is wanting to punish Israel, he allows and is in sovereign control of the David's action, and he's, who goes and says, go and number Israel and Judah. He tells Joab to do it. Look at verse 10, 2 Samuel 24, 10. But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people, and David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. So he knows what he did was wrong. It was evil, it was wicked, it was foolish. But God was using it not only to punish the Israelites, but as you keep reading the story, through this, the Temple Mount was purchased, where they would build the temple First temple, second temple, eventually a third temple. So then we see also King Ahab. This is that same story that I mentioned earlier, but you can see another aspect of God's sovereignty. First Kings 22, 6 and 23. Then the king of Israel, which was Ahab, gathered the prophets together, his false prophets. He had a lot of false prophets, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And they said, these false prophets, go up. For the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. So it is very much these false prophets giving a a false message um, to the king and giving him a false confidence that he's going to win this battle. In verse 23, though, Micaiah, the real prophet of God, says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. So because the Lord is declaring disaster for King Ahab, he allows this lying spirit to come into the false prophets to give him a false message. Of course, we know what happens. He goes out, someone at random, shoot, you know, he dies. Because the Lord had declared disaster. So he was sovereign over that evil um, of following those false prophets and the, and, the, and the lies of the prophets. Judas... Look at Matthew 26, 24. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. So this is all God's plan. God's in control. He even prophesied it. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. There could not be, in one sense, a greater evil than to betray Jesus Christ. When you knew him personally. I mean, it doesn't get more evil than that. And yet, it's as it is written. God was the one in control. Jesus, what happened to Jesus? You see the evil in his uh, situation. Acts 2.23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So there's the evil, the lawless men, killing and crucifying the Son of God. That's, that's, That's evil. And yet, it was the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Same thing, Acts 4, 27, 28. For truly in this city... They were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So lots of evil people doing evil things against the one holy Jesus. But behind it all, it was your hand and your plan that predestined it to take place. And then even with unbelievers, just in general, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12, Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness. So you can see that unbelievers make this conscious choice to not believe the truth, to take pleasure in unrighteousness, and therefore you can see that God allows a strong delusion for them so that they continue down that same path of being misled because that is what they have determined for their life through their unbelief and their love for unrighteousness. God sends a strong delusion so they will continue in their unbelief um, and be punished for it. Um, So then, all right, we see that God is sovereign over all things. A whole long list of, you know, nature, animals, luck, nations, life, man's ways, skills, abilities, rulers, decisions, all plans. Then we see that even over evil, 
through the examples of Joseph and his brothers, Pharaoh's heart, um, the Canaanite, Samson, King Saul, David, Ahab, Judas, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus and unbelievers, even sovereign over evil. So then it starts to make someone think, okay, well, does that mean that man does not have free will? It, that God is just determining everything and that there's not real decisions that man is making? No, the Bible teaches that we are very much free to make decisions, whatever decisions we want to make. So there's a real free will as well. Let's, let's look at that. When it comes to repentance, Matthew four seventeen. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's your choice. And I'm telling you, repent. Change from this to this. Repent. It's, it's in your power to make this decision. <coughs> Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. It's your choice to repent and to turn. Otherwise, those commands would not be given if you didn't have that choice. We do. Uh, to choose God. Joshua 24.15. Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods that your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. So choose. It's your choice. You have free will. Make the choice of whom you're going to serve. But we're going to serve the Lord. Uh, to follow Jesus, Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. Those are choices. Denying yourself. Taking up your cross. Following him. We have the free will to make those decisions. Obeying commands. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 28. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. So your choice, you can obey or you cannot obey. You can be blessed if you obey. You will be cursed if you choose to not obey. So it's, it's our choice. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's your choice. Your decision to make. James 4, 7, and 8. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Submit, resist, draw, cleanse, purify. All in the imperative. It's our choice. It's our choice to do these things or not to do these things. And there are results that come um, and you can see that especially with just decisions in general Galatians 6 7 do not be deceived God is not mocked for whatever one sows whatever you do you have the choice to do anything in your life whatever but know that there's either good that's going to come as a result or bad consequences that are going to come whatever man sows whatever man sows that is what he will also reap and then with salvation, Romans 1, 20 and 21 says, For his invisible attributes, namely, his, that is God, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Every person is without excuse because we all can perceive God's power that he created everything. His divine nature. He gives us a conscience. There's good and bad, and we have to submit ourselves to his, to that conscience that he gives us. Verse 21, For although they knew God, so everybody knows about God to some degree, but it says, Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So they had, everyone has a choice to honor God or and to give thanks to him for the, the things that he does for them, to submit. But if you don't, and you just become futile in your thinking because you don't want to acknowledge him, uh, your, your heart will continue to be darkened, and there will be a punishment for it. So, we can see that, yes, there still is very much man's free will to make the choices, to repent, to choose God, to you know, whatever we choose knowing that there are, you know, whatever we sow, that will we also reap, because God is sovereign over all things. But here's where I think a large chunk of the confusion comes. 
I think, and maybe this will help you in, to some degree, is that we use the phrase God's will for two different things. And I, they get confusing because it's two different things, and yet we use the same phrase for it, God's will. And I think there's, there's two very different aspects of God, of what it means when we say God's will, and I think when we can define those a little bit more clearly, then it helps a lot. So the two types of God's will. Number one, we use the phrase God's will when we are talking about God's perfect law, his nature, his holiness. So it's the choices that we should make. It's God's will that I follow him. It's God's will that I obey his commands. It's God's will that I love others. That's the choices that we should make. And we can see that in Exodus 20. 3 to 17, that's the Ten Commandments. No other gods, no images or idols. Keep God's name holy. Remember the Sabbath. Honor father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. It's just an example. Ten Commands. This is God's will, that we should live this way. Same thing in the New Testament. Matthew 22, 37 to 39. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So love God, with all your heart, love others. This is the decisions we should make. This is the life that we should be living. This is God's will. That's what is meant by God's will. That's the first uh, way we use it. But there is a second way. And that is God's perfect plan. God's perfect plan. And that is the choices that we do make. The choices that we do make. God's perfect plan. So sometimes when we don't do God's will in following his perfect law, it's still always according to his will, his perfect plan. Because he's sovereign over even the evil that we saw in in many passages. So God's perfect plan, these are the choices that we do make here on this earth. Genesis 50. Verse 20, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about the many, that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So the brothers did not make decisions that are according to God's will, that is his perfect law in nature. But ultimately, they did make decisions that were according to God's plan, his will in that sense. Acts 2.23, again, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan, the perfect plan of God, for knowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So they were not making the right decision according to God's will, these lawless men. But in another sense, they were making the decision according to God's will because this was his predetermined plan. Acts 4.27 and 28, for truly in this city they were gathered against, together against your holy servant, Jesus, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So again, it was God's perfect plan that this should take place, even though it was not according to his will in another sense, according to righteousness. But even, and it's not just that God is using the wrong decisions or the the, uh, the people who are not living against his will, that is his perfect law, according to his plan, but even when we make the right decisions, uh, truly according to his will in the first definition, it's also according to his plan in, this, in the second sense as well. Because look, Philippians 2, 12 and 13, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. So that's according to God's will in the sense that it's according to his, his law, his nature. You've always obeyed. So now work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So he's carrying out his plan through you when you obey him. When you do his will, you're doing his will. When you don't do his will, you're still doing his will. So I think that can help make that distinction that God has a will according to his law and how we should obey according to his nature, but he also has this plan that he's carrying out, that he's sovereign over, Um, And in that sense, that will always take place as perfect plan. So today, this is what we looked at, that God is sovereign over all things, even over evil, yet man still has free will. 
and that there are two types of God's will. His perfect law, or his nature, and that's the choices that we should make. And then his perfect plan, these are the choices that we do make. Next week we'll look at, a little bit more at salvation. Because there's this big, you know, how, how in the world can we, is, is God the one who's choosing us, or are we choosing him? So, we look at what God's word says regarding election, him choosing us for salvation, but also what God's word says about man's accountability. Then we'll look at the passages that have both in the same passage, election and man's free will. And then we'll talk about how they both work together. And a clue to that is, number one, free will isn't entirely free. And two, God creates all causes. And then the last week we'll look at God's sovereignty over prophecy. That if he make, he, he is sovereign over things because he prophesies detailed prophecies in in detail fulfills them. So he has to be sovereign over everything. God's sovereignty over prayer. You know, if he's the one who's determined, then why do we pray and ask for things if it's already determined? Uh, and then, why is there pain and suffering? If God is sovereign, he can control all things. Why is there pain and suffering in the world? So we'll look at that the third week. <laughs>